Let's talk about self-soothing. Self, self-soothing self is often a term that people search or people assume um, means negative things. Um, and especially because often we talk about it in relation to babies and we think babies can't do things by themselves. So let's be clear right from the start that self-soothing does not mean leaving babies or young children alone to cry. That's not what it means. Self-soothing is in fact a form of self-regulation, which is an imperative life skill. It's absolutely vital that we learn self-regulation. Self-soothing really is about being able to soothe yourself, reassure yourself, um, help yourself to feel better. And it's, you know, it, it's often really um, it's taken as a negative thing um, and, and people have, people do think that in order for a child to self-soothe um, means that you just ignore them and leave them to it. Couldn't be further from the truth. Actually you can teach this, this valuable, in, you know, absolutely vital life skill um, and, and we do teach this to our children. We teach it to our children in many, many other ways. So um, it's a shame that it gets so misconstrued and uh, gets some negative press really. So I want to talk a little bit about the difference now between self-soothing and actually homing in on self-settling because self-settling is what I talk about a lot more and is a lot more relevant when we're talking about sleep because self-settling isn't the same as self-soothing. You can soothe yourself be, because you're upset about a child snatched a toy from you and you can soothe yourself um, over that issue. That's not anything to do with sleep. Self-settling is when we talk about settling one's self to sleep. And a lot of people don't realize that that is a learned skill. In other words, it's not like breathing, we just come out knowing how to do that. <laughs> it's not something we just get. It's a learned skill, it means we need to be taught it. And it means we can unlearn it too, we can forget how to do it. It's a skill. Um, a lot of people don't realize that particularly parents in situations where they don't realize they've taught their child how to self-settle. You know, I didn't teach them anything. They just got it, they just sleep. They did teach them, they just, it was all very subconscious. You know, they probably just got into a really simple routine. The child took to that routine, it was a good match. It happened accidentally, but they were still taught. And, and so it, is, it, it absolutely is a learned skill. Other situations, you'll find you may have done that three times and then you have child number four and you think, well, what's going wrong this time? And actually nothing's going wrong. It's just that the way and the approach and what you did with your other three children isn't the right match for this child and this child needs a slightly different approach and that can catch you out and I see that happen quite often so you know in the same family and the same you know the same bloodline and the same parenting techniques can actually differ from child to child so um, if your child needs a different approach if your child needs um, you to be for instance taking um, a more active approach rather than it being quite easy and accidental and yeah just a nice routine and it works for us maybe uh, you know you, you have a child that it's a bit more difficult and and they need you need to really hone in on what exactly is right for that child let's ask this question why is it important for babies to learn to self-settle a lot of parents will go well why what you know what's wrong with me just giving my baby a cuddle and putting them to sleep or what's wrong with me feeding my baby off to sleep why why do they have to self-settle and the answer is they at the beginning they don't have to at the beginning it's fine if you help them along um, if you rock them to sleep or if you feed them to sleep you're actually you're doing it for them the settling bit you're doing it for them at the beginning, that's fine, but it won't work forever. You're not going to carry on doing that when they're seven, eight. <laughs> so it won't, it won't work. It's not sustainable over the long term. So there comes a point where you have to say, okay, well, look, I've been doing it for my baby. Now I'm going to start to do it with my baby and help my baby to do a bit more of this settling thing. And bit by bit, you hand the reins over so that then eventually your baby's just doing it on their own. They're doing it and you don't have to do it for them. You can still be there with your baby. You can still give all the love and, and attention in the world, but you're not actually doing the settling bit for them. So 
Uh, that's why it's important. It, it's absolutely vital. There's going to come a point where you won't be able to feed your baby to sleep or rock your toddler to sleep or whatever it may be. Um, they need to learn this skill. Um, and the sooner, well, I say the sooner the better. You can't do this you know, from birth, but um, it's best to not leave this like going on into toddlerhood and into early childhood because it becomes harder. Habits are harder to then shift and change. Um, and it's just tougher for them. So it's better to work on this earlier um, rather than waiting until those habits are really ingrained into toddlerhood and beyond. Which leads me on to my next question, which is when can you teach this? When can you teach self-settling? Um, they say from 18 weeks. Some people think it's six months. It's um, you know, somewhere in that ballpark, in, in the four, four to six month per period, um, your child will become cognitively ready and developmentally ready to go through practices which will help them be able to develop and master that skill. So it's somewhere in there, and obviously different children are gonna be different. What I would say to you, um, to be on the safe side, is that under 18 weeks, don't try to actually teach them this skill, just get into some good rhythms, just get into some good rhythms and practices. Once you're past the 18 week mark, then you can start to up the ante on that practice and just take it down a bit more of a, a teaching route where you're showing them a bit more, helping them along a bit more, giving them a bit more direction, and handing over the reins bit by bit. If your little one is six months or older, then I would say, yeah, absolutely go for it. There's no doubt from that point on. Um, they're very malleable and very ready to learn. And also from six months, the things you're doing will start to ingrain a lot more. So if they're not long-term sustainable things, then you definitely want to shift them onto a path um, that's going to be more long-term sustainable. So if you're at the six month mark, then absolutely, it's a great time. Anyone who's way past that thinking, oh gosh, I missed the window, it's never too late. It's never too late. It just can be a little tougher um, if there are habits deeply ingrained and that they're not going to want to let go of. But there are loads of things you can do to help a little one to shift onto a healthier um, and more conducive path that's going to help them become a really efficient, skilled sleeper. And the last thing I really want to talk about is the sleep nanny ethos around the whole self-settling thing. Our ethos is not in any way about leaving little ones to cry, and I, I say that all the time. Um, we are wired as mothers and as parents generally, we are wired to respond to cries, and it, it's right to respond to cries. We, we need to meet baby and young children's needs. We do also need to differentiate needs and wants, because sometimes a want isn't the best thing for the child. The needs need to be met, but it might not be a need. It's like feeding. If they need feeding, feed them. But if they don't actually need feeding, they just want feeding, that might not be the best thing. So differentiating the needs and the wants is really important as well. And, um, and the other thing is, I think it's really important to not try to push a baby or young child into doing things they're not ready to do. And that's another part of our ethos at the Sleep Nanny. What we do want to do is we want to squeeze the best out of them. We want to get them to their personal best. We want to get them doing the best they can do, just like we want for our children throughout life, you know, throughout their education and, and their, their lives. We want them to be, be giving it their best. And we, what we don't want to be doing is suffering with parental sleep deprivation and you know, child's development and everything else being hindered, health and well-being, everything hindered by sleep deprivation when they could be sleeping better. That's the key. When they could be sleeping better, let's help them to sleep better. If they're doing their absolute best for their developmental readiness, their age, their personality and everything else, if that is the best they can do, that's the best we can expect and that's great. But it's about not settling or suffering for less when things could be improved. And that's what we're all about here at Sleep Nanny. I hope this has been helpful for you and I hope that it clears up and gives you a better understanding on self-soothing and self-settling, why it's important and how you can actually go about implementing some of that. If you've enjoyed this, please do share it with anyone else that you think will benefit from this. I'm sure you know at least two friends who would you know, really 
take this message on board and it could actually change their lives. So go out there, pay it forward, share this with two friends right now. And um, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel for further episodes and click the link. You'll find there's a link that will take you to a really useful downloadable printable cheat sheet that will help you um, further with this with this topic so take that freebie it's yours and enjoy